framing the topic on, on my views is that it's really about moving from your research topic or your research question or your research specialty into a more global topic that includes social interests. That's something that is not only of interest, of course, for your peers of your specialty, but that could be of interest for other parts of society. Ideally, that could be of interest for everyone, but it doesn't have to be a core interest for everyone, but at least of interest for society. So very often it's about opening your topic and thinking, so what, why, first of all, why is my research important? What should I do it? I, I, I'm aware that sometimes it's, it's a cruel question, uh, but for a researcher to ask this, but asking yourself in which ways is it important beyond me, beyond us researchers? Does it, sometimes it's by itself important, sometimes by itself it can seem a bit too specialized, too narrow, but it contributes to a bigger picture. And then it's about opening the scope once again and thinking, what is the bigger picture to which my research contributes to? It's also about thinking about how other people may relate to this research. And they may relate because this, the topic is, is to, touches them, moves them uh, or strikes them, but it may be also, they may relate also through other means. For example, is there anything in your research that relates to cultural works? to books, to movies, to series? Is there a video game that you could link, a, a successful video game that many teenagers are playing or have played that in some ways can echo your research? Um, is the, if, if there are these means, you can really use them as a way to engage with the audience. And last, it, it will also often involve you in a, in a slightly intimate and sometimes in, introspective journey uh, asking yourself, what is my most memorable moment in my research? Did I have any memorable moment in my research? And if the answer is no, well, I let you draw the conclusion of this, but ask yourself, are there, were there any memorable moment? Moment I have been moved by my research. Mom and that might be when I wrote an article, but that might be when I did an experiment, that might be when I met someone, when I was in the field uh, outside and, and something happened, when I suddenly understood or when I got this result, any memorable moment that can be very anecdotal. It can be a moment in the near the coffee machine with another researcher, or it can be just meeting someone from a community you are studying and suddenly having a discussion when this is something you remember. Uh, so coming back to you, to you intimately as a person, what does move you? Why did you start working in that research or why do you still do it today? What still moves you? or what moments have suddenly moved you and maybe justified why you are doing this work. These tiny bits of, of more personal elements are very good starting point either to build a public engagement, engagement action or to include and add in an existing action to make the same things much more engaging and much more lively. It's not only about knowledge, it's also about you as a researcher and your intimate relationship with, with your work and with what you do. So. You'll have a bit of time to explore these questions. I just would like to give you three very simple examples uh, to, to, to make things clearer. If you have seen uh, some of the masterclasses that of some of the, the, the broader sessions that has been organized by Excite uh, regarding public engagement, one of them, in one of them, you had a researcher from the Europa European project. And Europa is a project that studies polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So, and all the researchers, 16 um, PhD researchers from these networks, mostly astrophysicists, but also astrochemists, uh, toxicologists in biology, were studying these very types of molecule called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So obviously, if you just say my specialty is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, this is not the best way to frame your public engagement action. And mostly, you will even in a social context, if you're having a dinner with someone and you just state this, the conversation will, will start to be difficult and you might have an awkward moment. So they started to reflect what could we tell about these types of molecules that are called PAH? Uh, should we, how could we talk about them? How could we present our research? And of course we could speak about the chemistry of these molecules, but another aspect is that they were studying the, this molecule in space and the presence, the possible presence of these molecules in the interstellar medium, meaning the just the big void that there is uh, in space, which is full of 
molecules here and there, mostly hydrogen, but also maybe possibly so, some of those types of molecules and some astrophysicists are studying this. So they also speak about these molecules as a pollutant on, on the Earth. And the last is one of the hypotheses, which is still a hypothesis, nothing sure yet, but that is in discussion in the scientific community, is that a hypothesis for the origin of life on Earth could be the presence of these molecules in space coming on Earth. So they have plenty of ways to tackle this. For example, the origin of life would be a very nice and strong element, although the reason they didn't choose this one as the, their core topic is that they felt not comfortable by the fact that it was not a fully validated hypothesis, not something that was, there was consensus among the scientific community. But still they could have taken this, the path, the, 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 the origin of life, and especially because we are not sure, and, and I would like just to stress this aspect for all of you, if there are some elements where you are not sure yet in your research that are still an issue, something in discussion in the scientific community. This is something extremely interesting for the audience. Uh, a very, uh, a, a trap we often, often fall into is we want to present sure knowledge and, and we are not presenting sure knowledge, we are presenting research. So it means knowledge in becoming. So telling about something that is actually a hypothesis, that is actually debated, doesn't tell people that, that that your research is weak. It tells people that your research is dynamic and alive. And often it's more something that triggers their interest because, oh, we're not sure yet. So I'm witnessing something that is being happening. And I, I, I don't think if you frame it properly that it will be seen as, oh, researchers are not sure yet. So that means re this research is not, not interesting, which is often a fear we have. And I think not a justified one, uh, especially for these kinds of topic. So the, what they cho chose here, is um, they, they focused on, on PAH in space. And they thought, well, the, we are looking for the presence of these molecules in space with astrophysics, with various instruments, various experiments. So we are actually cosmic carbon hunters. We are looking for these cosmic carbons in space. And several of them were video game players. And they thought that that reminds me one of the most famous video game, which is uh, Space Invaders. So what they did is in Bristol, they did several actions, but one very prominent one was in Bristol where they went into a big shopping mall, very popular shop shopping mall, and they managed to rent uh, a room in the shopping mall a space, and they entirely built an exhibition from scratch themselves, meaning they really built, built the exhibition together with some support, of course, from, from other actors, but they, they built it themselves, the researchers, and you can see here lots of activities on the, downside part on the down part where you can see for example people can play with little balls to make molecules and understanding what are these kind of types of molecules uh, they, they were they designed a range of activities all tackling their research but all designed in a way as you are into an arcade game room and that was the way that they, they could integrate their activity into this uh, this shopping mall let's I, I wanted to tackle different topics so this one was more in towards the natural sciences. Let's see one that is closer to the social sciences. If you tackle uh, homeless people, and there, there are people, people tackling homeless people here in Bristol as well, uh, and how could you tackle it? Well, first of all, homeless people are people, so you can tell their stories, and this would be a very nice angle. Or someone also, a researcher said, well, it could happen to you, this the, the, being homeless. So that's a very strong way to involve people, telling them, maybe we can look at, at homelessness as look at what could happen to you and experience what could happen to you and, and feel closer to, to, to homeless people. Another angle would be to say, we can have a look at life on the street. What is the experience of living in the street? Not only the bad one, but also is there a kind of, um, of link in homelessness people? What are the social links you have? Do you have no links? Or are, is there some kind of support one to each other? What is it living in the street? And, Another element is that uh, is the social invisibility. Homelessness is something that we can study, but most of all, uh, do not see it much, even if it's very present in our cities and places. So this idea of social invisibility was quite interesting also. And in, we ended up with having this in the Bristol Science Center with the curious. Uh, how do you become invisible? And you will meet some people working with homeless people and, and wondering, how do you become invisible 
but maybe not in the way you thought. Uh, and actually in the Bristol Science Center, there is a whole part of the exhibition called, how do you become invisible? And you can see different aspects, aspects of becoming invisible through optics and aspects about social invisibility and uh, with, with this element. So I think this is a very unusual and nice take on homelessness rather than frontally talking about homelessness, talking about invisibility and then moving into homelessness thanks to this. And I wanted one last example. So we have tackled natural sciences, social sciences. Let's see one example from the humanities and the arts. How do you engage people with poetry if you are a researcher in literature and poetry? Well, you can speak, of course, about the history of poetry and language. You can, of course, think that poetry can be beautiful. It can also be awful, and, and that's also interesting. And But start from this, which is a classic uh, view that many people have about poetry. You can also ask the question crudely, is poetry useful or useless? What is it useful to? And in that discussion, that may bring you to the question, well, poetry is useful because it's a kind of medicine. It's a, maybe for some people, it's a medicine for the soul or for the mind. So it's, so it's useful in this way. And you may end up with this activity, which is from Keele University, which is a poetry and prescription. So you have the most useful thing in the world, which is an ambulance. Who would say that is useless? Uh, an ambulance that will go into festival places, cities, and this, if you go into this ambulance, you will see a whole design with skulls, jars, and, and medicine-like things, and books of poetry, of course, and you will have a nurse here that will speak with you and have a consultation with you to see how you are doing and what's, what's, what is it going on, and this, this nurse will give you a prescription, a poetry prescription, of course, so you, you will be prescribed to read specific poetry works to be better. And I think that's, once again, a very nice take on poetry, uh, raising in a subtle way, very strong questions about our relationship to poetry. So I'm aware that, that here in, in our group, we have some people with various, very, various uh, research questions, some in law, some in humanities, some in natural sciences. So these are just three simple examples. And now it's gonna be up to you to work on yours. So the questions you must ask yourselves, I put them here again. First of all, why is my research important in general? How does it relate to people's life? Does it contribute to a bigger picture? But also, how does my research resonate with cultural works, with books, movies, series, games? And are there then more intimately, most more memorable moments that I lived with my research or people that were memorable with my research? And if we speak about people, we are very inclined to speak also about stories. What stories are there? Is there some underlying stories of specific people, of specific things happening into my research that I can, that I may use? We are going to move on now. We will uh, discuss a little bit with, about the audience. So choosing your core audience. Um, the, the first thing I would like to stress here in this title, core audience, is that by the word core, I mean that you don't have to choose just one audience and exclude all the other ones. You can have one core audience and include plenty of others, if not everyone else as well. But it's, it, you, you will find it often extremely useful to define one core audience and that will help you choose your action targeted and that will even give you some ideas that you might uh, or instead of being left with a I have to speak for everyone and that's not very helpful to you uh, to design the, the action it's much more helpful to know I have to speak to teenagers because if I know I have to speak to teenagers my question is what interests teenagers what are teenagers watching as movies as series or as, as books so if I uh, if I decide my audi uh, core audience I suddenly have ideas on how to approach my topic and translate it into public engagement. And then I can open it so it's open to everyone. But this will be helpful. The other thing is that there is a very strong saying in, in the public engagement community, which is there is no such thing as the general public. Uh, and I think this has never been true, that there is a general public. But obviously, in these last years, with the development of social medias, of groups, uh, groups of interest, this has even more strongly became true uh, with more structured groups of interest, groups of identities, group of practices. So you, there is no, no such thing as, as the general public. 
whenever we design a public engagement action, there is always the first temptation, which is my action is for everyone. We all want to be for everyone and that would be great. But once again, even to reach everyone, let's start by focusing on someone or on a core group first. So we are never for everybody. And I would like just to, to do a little, just a little to state of, so a little, so a few elements here. Uh, the, there is another issue in, in wanting to be for everyone uh, every time, which is that we are never for everybody. And that, that's fine. It's, it's impossible to be for everybody, to, be, uh, to design an experience that everybody will feel inclined to come in, feel welcome in, like, enjoy, feel they are easy speaking to them. This is almost uh, ne never the case for everyone. But very often when we design an experience and think it has to be for everyone, we often rely on classical rules to make it very open to a lot of people, to the, the largest majority of people, which is great. The issue is that the people who are not included in this vast majority are often the same actions to actions. So that means if we all build public engagement actions that are always for everyone, we're actually always making public engagement actions that are for the same group. And even if it's a very large group, it means that there are smallest group that are excluded for public, from public engagement actions. And we have some great studies on this. Uh, if you want to look into it, I'll send you uh, in, the res in a resource sheet with, with elements, but you can look into Emily Dawson's work. Uh, she's a, she's a, a researcher working on ex exclusion in public engagement practices. And it, there are several other works as well that are extremely interesting in showing us how by with these very wide open experiences, obviously everyone isn't fully included. And if you have a different culture, if you are a migrant from, coming from someone else, if you have a different type of experience in your life as a person, in your family, on your identity, there are some elements that sometimes are not for you. And if we don't pay attention to being inclusive of this group, they are always the same ones who are not included. And that ends up that when we are doing our actions, even though we are bringing great things to society, great knowledge, great links to researchers and engagement in research, if it always benefits the same groups, we are also un uh, unfortunately reinforcing inequalities. So it's, it's, very, it's a very good practice to focus. And if you have an equality concern, to focus on specific groups wh whom are relevant and whom you specifically want to ensure are engaged in your action and to make something specifically for them. And then the other ones will probably feel included as well in COM, but try to focus. So that's for the inclusion part. We can speak more about inclusion if you'd like, because uh, that's a very important part in, in public engagement. Now, as, as I said before, it's, all, it's far more efficient and helpful to actively choose and target a specific audience. Also, when you want to choose your topic, what we did just before, or when you, you want to choose your partners, or when you want, want to choose your practice of public engagement. Maybe a conference is great from one audience, but it is absolutely the wrong one from another, for another audience. Uh, when you want to change the environment, the setting in which you will do your public engagement, should you do it in a bar? Should you do it in a swimming pool? Should we do it in the university? Well, it depends a lot on the audience, on the core audience. And if you want to say, I'm for everybody, well, not everybody likes swimming pool, not everybody goes to bars, not everybody goes to university. So it's much, much more sim simple if you have chosen your audience. Uh, and of course, the last question is, how do we define an audience group? And there are several ways to do this. So we will not do a, a, any course on segmentations. I, can, I will send you all some links on segmentations, but it can be very simple. Uh, if you were to define an audience group. Can you write in the chat how you would define an example of audience group that you may focus on or that another researcher may focus on? Can you give me examples of research groups, of, of sorry, of audience groups that you think could be relevant? How would you define them? All right, just write it in the chat for now. ICT developers. So this could be, uh, this could be an interesting uh, group. You can indeed define a group, an audience by saying, I'm gonna engage with a specific type of, of um, occupations of people who have the same kinds of jobs, the ICT developers, uh, or who work in the same field of ICT globally. 
And these are, I'm going to engage you with the ICD professionals. Children, children is, it would be a category as well. Obviously, I will, if you tell me I'm going to engage with children, I'm going to ask you to be a bit more specific because a 13 year old child, a 10 year old child, and a six year old child have extremely different needs and would need usually quite different public engagement actions. So yes, children would be a category, but once again, I would be more a bit more narrow and specific in terms of age groups. Uh, visitors to a science museums, people already interested in science. And this could be absolutely a group, uh, definitely. Here, marginalized minorities, refugees, LGBTQI, racialized Muslim communities. These are also very clear groups and see how these immediately link you with possible partners forces you to go into specific settings. So if you choose a very specific group like um, the Muslim community, you know that you're going to have to partner with the Muslim community, that everything will have to be framed according to this. Users of a specific technology, that's absolutely possible as well. Policy advisors, yes, policymakers can be a group you want to engage in. Girls in order to promote STEM studies, yes. Here again, girls is a very wide category. So. I would advise to, so I think it's a good, very good start, but I would advise to be a bit more specific on uh, when you think about girls, is it going to be about girls who are 15 and thinking about their futures or about younger girls uh, when they are seven years old and when they are building their first relationship to science. So maybe choose a little bit more, more, uh, more closely. Better millennials, absolutely. Uh, also, so this is once again, a quite wide category uh, and uh, so, so I would be a bit more specific, but that's a very good, very good point because when we say that age group, we think also about their current practices in terms of, for example, digital practices, social media practices, and obviously that pushes us to say, okay, I'm interested into millennials who use social media, so I'll design mental image directions on social media. Family members who are in charge of sorting household waste, very nice. So. This is, um, this, we'll look for families. We'll look for families and we'll talk about waste. Uh, so that would be a, a great group. Patients, absolutely. Top managers, once again, we have the specific job position. So that could be in, in different types of companies, but a specific position that would be absolutely possible. So as you can see here, we have very different types of categories. Some are about the occupation, the work. Some are about the age group or the gender. Some others uh, can be also about uh, socioeconomic background or about their identity as an LGBTQI person or as a refugee, someone who has experienced something, something specific because they are a, a refugee or because they are a patient of a specific disease. But it can be also so other kind of things. You can also go to just people having an interest in um, ecology and the environment, people having an interest in biking, people who like sports, people. So you can speak about interest. You can speak about uh, activities, people who actually do kayaking or judo. You can speak about uh, opinions and views on the world. People who are, uh, for example, uh, uh, you, we just spoke about, about the far right and the uh, fascism, people who are just um, extremely striped by the far-right fascism and who want to react against this. People have a specific view on the world and who are touched by a specific issue. So these are as well groups and they can be very interesting groups if your research has a link with that interest to look for this group and to connect with a partner that has access to this audience. So how do we choose our audience? We, for this, we will have to ask the following questions and bear in mind that once again it can be we can choose by demographics meaning by uh, age group socioeconomic background gender and elements like this but we can also choose by psychographics by interests activities opinions and views and other elements like this things are quite open the questions you may ask yourself are once again who is relevant for my research who is in some ways linked with my research who could contribute to my research? Maybe they will have some ideas, opinions, views that could be beneficial to your research, but all of, all of course, who will also be interested by your research. But then we can open it a bit more. 
and we can ask yourself with whom would I like to share my research? And that can be quite personal. It can be because you think it's important to tell them about your research, but it can also be just because you'd like to meet those people and you are ready to do some efforts because you think for you that this has a strong meaning or just before we spoke about um, migrants and or LGBTQI people, if you are moved by this question, maybe this is the group to whom you are ready to make these efforts. And I think that is for me as well, this is a very valuable element. If there is a personal motivation in the researchers, we should use this because this is, will fuel the, the, the action and will actually support it to be better. So uh, with whom would you like personally to go and share your research for professional reasons or personal reasons? There is a, a wider question, who, which is who is around? And that must, may seem very anecdotal, but many public engagement actions begin like this, to be, to be honest. In practice, many of them begin because there is a school close, close to my place, or I was in, do, practicing tennis and there was, there was this tennis group of children and I thought maybe I could tell them about my research. So sometimes having a look who is around is a good, is a good, uh, good start as well. Who do you have access to already? If you do an activity, if you have an interest, do you have access to specific groups already? Can you use them for a first public engagement action without too much efforts? And if it works well, then you can do a second one with more difficult to reach audience. With whom would it be meaningful and motivating for you? And also, also speaking about inclusion, who does not usually have access to this kind of knowledge experience? And you may want to be the one who makes the make a difference. So, I let you think about this. Once you have decided your audience, you will you will think, okay, I am not alone with this audience. I will need support and I can have support. So what do you need access to? This is the question you should ask yourself. To, do I need access to, to what? What kind of infrastructure? What kinds of audience? What kinds of skills? What kinds of support? For example, do I need science engagement professionals to help me design my actions? And luckily there are in plenty of universities, you have some professionals that are some, some whose job is to support researchers in science engagement. And if you do not have this, well, you have science centers and museums. And the good thing is that you have here, Marie from Excite, uh, from the European Network of Science Centers and Museums who can help, me, help you find your closest science center or science museum or science engagement association or any science engagement professional close to you that can help you in your action. So I know we have Slovenian people in the room and we, you have here a photo from Hisha Experimentov, mm -hmm. which is an outstanding, truly outstanding science center in Ljubljana. Uh, who, and they are fantastic, not only for the exhibition, uh, but also for the science show. They run uh, a science, science festival every year uh, in Ljubljana and often in other cities of Slovenia as well. So when you work with them, with your local science center, they could integrate you not necessarily for an mm. exhibit, but also for a day of conference, an action, going into a city and making a small science center in a classroom, which is the thing they often do, uh, doing something in the science festivals. There are plenty of ways to get involved with them. So I urge you to get in touch with the, the professionals because they also know the field very well. They do not only have access to skills, but also to possible places and communities. So these are a, a truly, truly important resource. So do you need access to some specific people, some communities or some groups, either for the audience or for support? And for example, this is a, a, an example I like very much from a, an organization called the Human Library. And the principle of this library is that just like in the library, you would come and borrow a book. Here you will come and borrow a human being for 15 minutes and you will have a conversation with that human being for 15 minutes. So for example, you will come and say, and they will say today is the human library. And we have today, to, you can borrow someone who say, I am an obese, I am a refugee, I am a body, body someone who body, modify my body, I am a homeless person. And you will borrow that person for 15 minutes and have a conversation. And the whole goal of this obviously is to understand how the person you are meeting is way beyond the stereotypes you may have according to these kinds of people. And what you think a refugee is might be extremely different to what are actually refugee, what background they have, what experience they have. So you will meet someone and that may open your views. And, and it's all based on, on conversations of 15 minutes with 
people who ha have a label but often have do not fit the stereotype uh, linked to this label. So if you want to make something like this re regarding your research, you will need some of th these people that are related. So you will need them to support you and to be with you in this action. Communities, if you want to, to work with a specific community, you will probably need to, the, to a community leader or organizer and, and discuss with them how you can work together. Do you need access to public spaces uh, or places or services? Uh, these are examples from fun palaces here in Bristol. You have people um, in the wellspring surgery, so a surgery where people get uh, receive uh, treatments and see doctors and receive, do have consultations. And they are here painting some bikes, uh, some city bikes that are free for everyone to use and that are being painted with health related messages. Uh, you can see the Bristol Ferry. I told, it, uh, I told about it last time as well or uh, up there also some uh, young people working on with researchers on the impact of smoking. And if you want to have access to these places, to a school, to a surgery where you have patients, uh, to do an activity with them, uh, to a ferry uh, transportation, you will have to find the related partners as well. So a lot will be about building a strong partnership to have the right setting, to have access to the right audience. As you can see here, you'll, you'll see this later a bit more calmly, but you, you can see a wide range of possible uh, actors that you can partner with, uh, whether it is businesses, whether it is social enterprise, NGOs, or the public sectors, uh, policymakers, and how you can partner with them and have either skills or infrastructures or advice, or sometimes credibility so that people will get interested. Thank you very much for your participation in this session. A few questions for you for this week. First of all, in the topics, audiences and partners you have already identified, do you find any alignment, anything that strikes you that maybe could be interesting and that could start the, the, the idea of the possible action? What seems easy at this stage? Is it easy to partner with these kinds of partners or is it difficult? Is it, are these audiences hard to reach one or easy to reach one for you in your particular situation? So what seems easy or difficult to you? Can you have uh, some first conversations about this, about just what you have imagined today with one of your peers, with the researchers that sits in the same office as you or with someone else at the coffee machine? Or can you discuss it with a non-researcher, maybe even with a potential partner, not sealing any deal for now, but just telling them, no, I thought about doing a public engagement action. Do you think I could do this in your supermarket? Do you think I could do this in your shop? Do you, can, do you think you could chat, I could chat with your community and see if we could do something together? So do you think this week you could think about these alignments, find what seems easy or difficult, and have a couple of conversations just to probe a little bit, feel a little bit where the difficulties lie, but also where unexpected opportunities may arise.